Welcome to this morning's Newsmaker here at the National Press Club. School choice, what works, what doesn't, and what will they say about it on the campaign trail? And perhaps most importantly, is it true? That is the topic of this morning's panel discussion. With us we have Dr. Kevin Wellner of the University of Colorado and the director of the National Education Policy Center. We have Dr. Gary Miron of Western Michigan University. Dr. Alex Medler, he's the Vice President of Policy and Advocacy for the National Association of Charter School Authorizers. Mary Filardo is with us. She is the Executive Director of the District of Columbia's 21st Century School Fund. And finally, Dr. Adam Schaefer is a policy analyst. He's with the Center for Educational Freedom at the Cato Institute. Uh, I also want to point out that Drs. Wellner and Miron are two contributors to a new book that's called Exploring the School Choice Universe, Evidence and Recommendations. It's being released this week, and the book raises questions that are critical to the performance of school choice programs. Just to lay down a bit of the ground rules, first of all, we're going to have statements from our panelists, and the remainder of the time will be reserved for questions, which start with who, what, when, where, why, how, not pontification, and I will be holding everyone to that. I also want to ask that anyone coming in, please make sure that the ringers, buzzers, vibrators on your telephones, pagers, whatever else are turned off. We do not want to be rude to our speakers while they're talking. So, uh, Dr. Wellner, are you to begin? Sure. All right, thank you. Thank you, Jamila. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Education is shaping up to be a major issue in this education cycle, in this election cycle, excuse me. The president has devoted the past week to education, starting with a radio address on Saturday and continuing with a swing through Ohio. And then yesterday, he was in Las Vegas talking about budget cuts and teachers and growing class size. School choice is a big part of the education discussion. Governor Romney has made the voucherization of Title I and IDEA, or special education funding, a centerpiece of his educational policy. Essentially, what he's, promo promo what he's promoting is, is federal vouchers. And his proposed policy would mark a huge change in the federal role. President Obama has also strongly promoted school choice policies, particularly charter schools. His strategy relies to a great extent on scaling up nonprofit education management organizations that are thought to be successful in working with students in high poverty communities. But as we'll discuss, Vouchers and charter schools are only two of the many types of school choice. And one voucher or charter policy can look and act very differently from another. So what is school choice? And how can we most sensibly understand and use school choice? Gary Muron and I, along with two of our colleagues at the National Education Policy Center, Pat Patricia Hinchy and Bill Mathis, we set out to answer that, and our project uh, resulted in the book that Jamila Bay just mentioned, um, exploring the education, excuse me, exploring the school choice universe. The main rationale for this project was that while there are scores of other school choice books out there, they cover only one or two topics, or more often, one or two types of choice. So the first thing we did was to think about all the issues prompted by choice-based policies. Listen to this list. It's really it's, it's surprising how many issues there are. We have basic philosophical and democracy issues. We have questions about legality and litigation, uh, how parents make choices, who chooses and why, uh, how choice schools are held accountable, how choice is funded, and what incentives arise out of those funding choices, teacher quality issues, questions about innovation and innovativeness, uh, effects on segregation and stratification, competition effects of choice schools upon other schools, um, and of course, the effects of choice policies on measured student outcomes. So for the book, we asked experts in each one of these topics to uh, tell us what, uh, what, what research, what is the evidence base on all these different issues. But we also started to think about what do we mean by school choice? 
School choice isn't a single thing, so we identified a half dozen different types of choice. Uh, charters and vouchers uh, were, were certainly two of those, but we also pointed authors to, we pointed authors to homeschooling, to cyber schools, to magnet schools and other types of intra-district school choice, often called open enrollment policies, um, to between district school choice, and to tuition tax credits that provide public, a public subsidy to private school tuition, similar to vouchers. I call these neo-vouchers. Now, before I hand this over to Gary Miron, I want, I want to uh, give a preliminary answer to my earlier question, what is school choice? There is a widespread misconception about school choice, that it's a complete policy in itself. In reality, it's a broad policy tool that can be included as part of a complete policy, of a complete education policy. It's not a policy in itself any more than professional development is a policy in itself or bell schedules are a policy in themselves. Um, at the most basic level, school choice is simply an approach to student assignment. I might tell you, for instance, I favor school choice. And my statement can be coherent in the sense that I might be a libertarian or that I buy into certain assumptions about the benefits of competition or whatnot. But when you hear me make a statement like, I favor school choice, your next question should be, well, how do you favor structuring or using school choice? That is, what, what does your policy using school choice actually look like? Let me end with something that I hope will provoke some conversation uh, as we open this up. It seems to me that, that our lawmakers and our candidates for office are not, in fact, asking these sensible questions. It seems like they're wrongly looking at school choice as a policy, not as a tool. And this misunderstanding blinds them to all the ways that school choice tools can be used. So we end up with choice-based policies that have a set of rules arrived at through default or through political pressure, rather than careful and hopefully evidence-based deliberation. Simply put, if we don't ask the right questions, we don't tend to get the right answers. Thank you. Gary? Thanks. Good morning, everyone. I want to cover three general points. I want to talk about the arguments for and against school choice. I want to uh, share a few comments about the overall prevalence of school choice, how many students are participating in choice programs across the nation. And I also want to talk uh, again about this point about the importance of policy for, for policymakers to be thoughtful as they plan, develop, and implement school choice programs. But first, let's talk about the arguments. One of the key arguments that we see uh, raised up about for ch school choice is that it's going to bring in that entrepreneurial spirit and in, spirit into our education system, and that through competition, schools will get their acts together and, and perform better. And this is an argument that we often hear. On the other side, opponents often say that that competition also comes with profit making because we're bringing in private groups that are going to bring that entrepreneurial sp spirit, and there'll be winners and losers. Uh, there's also a concern from the opponents that with this competition, with the involvement of private actors, that we're going to lose control of the schools, uh, mostly through privatization. Another argument for school choice is the way that when parents can uh, look at their students' unique needs, they can uh, identify school choices that would best match those needs. And, and the, the school system can be more efficient and effective when schools are with their unique learning styles and unique uh, uh, pedagogical profiles, when those are matched with students that, 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 that uh, when parents match their students with those different choices, we're going to have better schools. With that sorting preference, that's one argument for. On the other hand, opponents are often saying, well, there's sorting that goes on, but the sorting can occur by demographics, and that school choice can promote segregation by race, by class, by ability, and also by uh, the language of instruction. And so this is what uh, some of the opponents are rather concerned about. On the one hand, some of the arguments uh, for choice uh, are about quality. This is a way to pursue quality. Opponents, on the other hand, are saying 
equality. We have to be concerned about equality in the education system. So we hear these arguments back and forth. Uh, there's been a lot written about these and other arguments for and against school choice. Much of this has been rhetorical in nature, and what we've tried to do in this volume is to bring together authors that are going to summarize the empirical evidence uh, on school choice and to provide a, a better basis for policymakers and others as they think thoughtfully about school choice. Uh, let's talk about prevalence um, and how many students we actually have in school choice programs. Uh, it was rather surprising for us to find that in the nation as a whole and across those six categories or six types of school choice that we looked at, close to 30 percent of the nation's uh, public school students are choosing another school than the one that they are assigned to. Um, over the years, uh, there's been a lot of attention given to vouchers and in the last two decades, more attention given to uh, charter schools. But when we look at the overall picture, and we have a, a chart there, here that depicts the enrollments in different types of school choice options, um, it's the inner district or intra-district choice programs. With, it's within the public school sector where most choice is taking place and close to nine million students are participating in that kind of choice. When we get down to the other uh, types of choice, there's some new um, programs or reforms that are taking off. Charter schools continue to grow as an option, providing more options for school choice. Today, about 1.9 million of our students in the nation are in charter schools. Homeschooling, we consider as, a, as, a, a, as an option of, of choice. And we have about 2 million students in the nation that participate in homeschooling. And this is more than what we see in many other nations. It's, that's about 3% of all students in the country are in homeschool uh, provisions. Um, and then we have a couple other things that are, are growing uh, more rapidly, particularly virtual schools. Um, in these virtual schools, uh, today they number about 250,000 students in the nation are in full-time virtual schools. And it's growing rapidly and we're seeing more attention to this, especially with many states lifting their caps now in virtual schools. And this also is uh, growing very rapidly because when a virtual school opens, they can often open with four to five student, four to five thousand students in the first year, and some of them grow to be more than eleven thousand students in the space of a few years. Um, and last point I want to take up is about this uh, need for more thoughtful policy making, especially when it comes to school choice. And this is something that we underline again and again throughout the throughout the book. Um, uh, I, I shared um, last. Last year in the Michigan Senate, I shared testimony about the, the importance of a thoughtful um, policy making when it comes to school choice. And the senator at the time who was sponsoring the bill to lift the cap on charter schools and virtual schools in Michigan, he had uh, suggested that I was against school choice. And he said that, what am I supposed to tell these 40 families that have uh, researched and found a really successful charter schools? And he was suggesting that I didn't think that those, those families should, should be able to uh, uh, t take advantage of that choice. And I was very polite in my response to the senator, but I reminded him that, yes, you have to be concerned about those 40 families, but what about the 60 families that are choosing a charter school that won't be successful? And what about all the other students that are left behind? And when we think about school choice, we have to think about all these groups. Uh, because we don't want it, if, if we're going to look at the education system as a whole, we, we don't want it to be winners and losers. We want to find a place where the system can serve all, and we have to be concerned about those. Um, in the book, again, we, we uh, encourage policymakers to revisit the goals, the overall goals for our education system. And looking at those goals for the education system, then go ahead and plan, uh, design, and implement school choice reforms that are going to pursue those goals and not let school choice um, be an end of itself, but instead be a tool, uh, a tool that can be used to, uh, to pursue those common goals and also to pursue the common or best interest for all students. Thanks. Thank you, Dr. Miron. Uh, next, let's uh, just go down the line and have you, Dr. Adam Schaefer, again, policy analyst with the Center for Educational Freedom at Cato. Oh, thank you for having me here today. Uh, um, my perspective is a, a little different a lot of times than, should, do, you, do you want, uh, why not? Yeah, okay, statement. all right. Yeah. You've got the podium music, lectern <laughs> Uh, we're on the opposite side of, of, of the school choice issue a lot of times, but I find uh, that I often agree w with you on, on some particulars. Um, not surprising, one of those things I, I agree on is uh, the, 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 the interesting aspects of uh, education tax credits, which vouchers get the lion's share of attention. Your book, Neo Vouchers, all 
absent the title, which I, I think is a little uh, tendentious, but uh, is, is a great kind of overview of what's going on in that policy space. But I think, I think you hit on something that is extremely important and has been an increasing concern of my own, which is uh, choice isn't a policy. Um, uh, and there is a huge amount of diversity in the choice policy space. I would disagree a little bit in, in the fact that I think it can be a policy, but saying I support school choice, that's almost meaningless. Um, when uh, Randy Weingarten of the uh, teachers unions uh, and uh, the most ardent free marketers all say that they support school choice, what does it really mean? Does it have any meaning left? And, and I think not. You have to look at the specific policies. So in, 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 the, in the space, uh, charter schools are still government schools. Uh, the approval of the pedagogical approach, the approval of the schools rests on the authority of a government-sponsored board. Um, private schools uh, uh, can't apply, obviously. Um, it's a public uh, charter school, although uh, private operators can run the schools, they can't teach religion in the school. Um, and the diversity is limited by the, the perspective and the um, vision of the charter authorizers, uh, uh, ultimately. Um, in the private sector, vouchers and, 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 and tax credits open up options in, in, in the private sphere, um, but vouchers use government funds. And uh, this typically requires regulations uh, to provide a accountability of some sort to taxpayers who fund the program. Uh, tax credits, on the other hand, are entirely funded within the private sphere and, and uh, distributed through private nonprofit organizations. The taxpayer who earned the funds in the first place is allowed to direct those funds to the school that uh, comports with their values and, and, and they think is doing a good job. And, and so there's layers of private accountability there and accountability directly to the taxpayer uh, that don't necessitate this regulatory structure that we find uh, uh, invariably in voucher schools. So I think, I think this is an extremely important uh, um, uh, thing to consider and uh, I'm, I'm happy you've written a, a book that uh, gets into a little bit more detail on it. Uh, everyone's a choice supporter now but we all have to decide I think what kind of choice supporter we are. It's not good enough now to say um, I support school choice. Um, uh, we need to get into the uh, nitty-gritty of the, uh, the policy details, what's really going on in the guts. And there's huge variation I'm sure you're going to discuss in, in charter authorizers and the structure of, of charter school systems, how they're authorized, how their um, charter can be revoked, if it's revoked, how often does it happen, on what criterion uh, is it revoked. And in the voucher space, uh, what kind of regulatory structure do we have for voucher schools uh, to ensure accountability to the taxpayers? Um, is parental choice enough? Um, in, in most of the systems, they say no. There's a huge fight in Louisiana right now going on uh, over this question. Should creation of schools be allowed to uh, participate in the voucher program in Louisiana? Should an Islamic school? Uh, um, and uh, th this uh, uh, came up recently. A, a conservative voucher school supporter um, was upset by the fact that all religious schools could participate. And, and uh, um, with education tax credits is the three layers of accountability in the private sector are enough. The accountability to parents, the accountability to a nonprofit uh, association that passes out the scholarships, and the accountability to the taxpayer who uh, uh, funded those uh, scholarship organizations in the first place. Is that enough for us uh, to, be, uh, uh, to be happy with? Um, so I would say yes, I, I, think, I think this is um, uh, important. Um, the outcomes of, of, of these programs in terms of their impact on achievement and other measurable, um, measurable uh, um, effects on student performance, on graduation rates is hugely important. Um, but also, as you pointed out, people support different policies for multitudes of reasons. And I think the ability for parents to take control of their child's education and direct it uh, uh, in a way that they see fit is a hugely important thing. Um, and uh, something that should be a huge part of the consideration, not just get lost in, in these metrics. Although I would point out uh, just today there's a release of a study looking at the graduation effect uh, of a voucher program, vi private voucher program in New York City from many years back. These kids are now going to college and they found a huge uh, increase in graduation rates uh, among the children who received the lottery assigned, randomly assigned uh, voucher compared to those who, who lost out. 
So I, I would, I'll leave it at that because I think we probably have a, a lot to discuss. But um, uh, I encourage everyone to take a look at this book and really consider the differences between these, these different options and what a system and a real policy structure means. It's not just a name. It's not just increasing choice because all these systems have uh, potentially radically different results. Thank you very much. Um, hi, uh, I'm Alex Medler. I work with the National Association of Charter School Authorizers. And I, I find the whole book very interesting, and I'd recommend you, you dig into its details. But I'm going to uh, speak a little bit about choice in general, and then probably a little bit more about charters. Um, I'd agree uh, that a key lesson from this, and that we should take into our policy discussions or political discussions and implementation, is that details matter, policies matter, structures matter. Um, I'd also add that who's acting matter. So you know, this is another book about school choice and charters. I look forward to seeing the hard copy. But for the last few that have come out, authorizers don't even make it into the index. So um, not to mention getting their own chapter. And the treatment here is not a lot deeper. It's starting to recognize it. But the, the spirit is correct that we need to look at the, the details. We need to look at who's acting. And I'd say one of the things that's important is to realize that um, as you, as you look at more and more different topics and you take into account different purposes and everything that's going on, it becomes harder and harder to simplify and to say, well, what's, what's, the, what's the bottom line? Um, so for a reporter or a policymaker who says, was it working or not? It's like, well, it depends on what you think working is and what your goal was, and it depends on which one you look at. So that's, that's a frustrating answer, but it's actually pointing where, um, where some promise is. I say it's, it has some promise when we realize um, that uh, the decisions that, let's say, a school board makes or a commissioner of education makes about whether to approve a particular charter school affect that school. And then they need policies and tools that help them make individual decisions. And those individual decisions, just like in markets of choice, the actions of policymakers come together to give us the overall picture. So what I mean to say is that charter schools, on average, um, performing equal or better than traditional schools isn't such an important question. What's important is how, are the, how is the distribution of, of the schools? Are there more good ones and more bad ones? If, if there's both extra good schools and extra bad schools, um, that's different than saying on average they're just a little bit better. So the fact that we have too many bad charter schools but some, a whole bunch of good schools, that's something we can act on. We can't act on the data that charter schools are on average a little bit better or worse. So school boards can close the bad ones. They can replicate the good ones. Um, we will never get rid of the charter school movement. We will never get rid of choice. It's already there. Um, people want it. They won't, they won't tolerate us getting rid of it. So the question is, what decisions should we make? The policies affect how people make those individual decisions, and authorizers decide which schools should, should close, which schools should open, which, and they encourage which one to replicate. And those decisions can be informed by real data, too. So I'm impressed by the, the asking, let's, let's understand the nuances and the difference. And I agree with the conclusion that policies matter and that the details matter. We then need to dive into some of those to figure out how to act. Um, I would make one more uh, observation that I think is worth noting, is that if we think of, let's say, 10 or 14,000 people choosing um, their school, I'd argue that we should then add everybody who bought a house since their kid was born. Because uh, schools are traditionally assigned in the status quo by your housing. Housing is one of the most segregated things by race and class in America. And so the status quo is based on the choices families have made about where to buy or rent their home. And so there's, there's, no, there's no option to not choose your school. Um, you do so when you choose where you live, and that's a very inequitable choice in the first place. Um, so I look forward to the rest of the discussion. I, I just, um, I'm curious to see which of these different purposes we can dive into today, knowing that we can't get into so much of the meat. But uh, there's a lot of meat out there that's um, worth exploring, and getting down to a finer level is where this book's going in the right direction. Good morning. I, I think because I'm the one furthest from the PhD, I get to speak about it from the ground a little bit more. Um, we work uh, locally with urban districts primarily on um, uh, community issues associated with education reform, a lot related to facilities as it, 
as it works out. And so we've ended up in this choice space because of the educational facility planning issues and also because of the uh, policy issues related to planning. So um, one of the things that, that as we look at choice, we see it as you know, sort of the, the discussion related to Brown v. Board. It was a student assignment case that went to the Supreme Court. And uh, it's obviously a very contentious thing, student assignment. And choice itself is a very contentious issue, and not just about personal choice, but also about uh, the set of um, systems that kind of respond to that. And in the District of Columbia right now, the chancellor is just going to start a process of looking at the student assignment policies and the choices that parents have. And one of the things as we've looked at it already, to some extent, the data on it is what we're finding is who's really choosing? Are the, are the parents actually the ones controlling the choice or is it the operators controlling the choice? Uh, in the District of Columbia, you have a right to get into a lottery, but you don't actually have the right to stay at that school. So, so there's some real differences in this and I and I'm, was delighted to learn about the book because I think that that for the communities on the ground trying to figure out where kids get to go, who's going where, that, that we really do need this larger frame to look at it because it's not necessarily as, as ideologically it's framed whether, from one version or another, whether it's like greater equity, well, not necessarily. More equality, well, you know, maybe not. Um, better quality in terms of the school achievement, hmm. Sometimes, sometimes not. So it's a, it's a very um, uh, complicated issue. And I, and I think that one of the things that we're very concerned about is that we actually think the democratic processes associated with navigating these various reasons to have a choice system need to be at the heart of it because it's, it's not clear, it's not simple. You know, parents who should have the forum to, to, to look at uh, religious differences or quality differences or instructional program differences. They should do that, but they should be doing that in public space around a publicly governed, we believe, and, and uh, elected, I would argue also, um, body that really is trying to navigate our biases, our values, and they're part of, the, it's part of what makes us a community, and I think that some of what we've seen in the District of Columbia, and we're working with folks in Chicago and in New York City, is that when the system is defined to be, you know, what's the best choice for your child, as opposed to really a citizenry saying kind of, how do we want the next generation to, to sort of learn from the knowledge that we sort of evolved and are trying to preserve over time, and how do we want our communities to be um, that, that we've really lost a fabric to community that is essential to civil society. And um, the, one of the characteristics of choice is that it isn't place-based. And so the, uh, while there are enormous issues around the segregation of our communities, um, we find that in, in many places, our communities might be more integrated than our schools. And so I think that, um, you know, kind of wrestling with that certainly is part of what we're gonna be doing here in the District of Columbia. Boston is doing it right now. Um, other cities and communities are trying to figure this out. And um, anyway, I, I think it's, it's a real service, quite honestly, and hopefully we'll be able to translate the work that you've done and get it sort of in, in the hands of districts and, and communities as we try to figure this out in the District of Columbia. Thank you. Thank you. All right, uh, thanks one and all. Um, let's open the floor for questions. We've got a bit of time. Let's get started. All right, well, I guess I have the, <laughs> oh. Can I jump in and oh, respond to Oh, please do, yeah. So I wanted to pick up on, on the last, the last point that Mary made, uh, which was that, that in, a, in a lot of places, what we see in, in choice schools um, is an amplification of the stratification we see in neighborhoods. Um, and, and that 
flies in the face of, face of a lot of initial mo motivation of uh, cho school choice advocates who looked at segregated residential areas and said, hey, we don't, it doesn't have to be this way. We don't have to have what are called catchment area areas or neighborhood assignment to schools. We could open this up and that will alleviate a lot of what we see in terms of, um, of what I think it was Alex mentioned, uh, the idea that, that one form of school choice is you buy a house in a neighborhood that serves a particular school, but it doesn't have to be that way. And so the idea of using school choice to alleviate neighborhood segregation um, was part of the initial motivation. And it's depressing that we see the opposite happening, that we see sort of a layer of stratification on top of housing of housing segregation. And we talk about segregation and stratification, we're talking not just about uh, uh, racially identifiable schools, but also by class, by test score, by English language uh, ability, by um, special, special needs. Um, am I forgetting anything? It's pretty much. <laughs> and, and so we see all these forms of stratification in different forms of, of school choice. Now there are, there are major exceptions to this, um, and you know, when, when we use sort of general it tends to be sorts of statements. It's important to recognize that there are exceptions. But when we're talking about sort of the, the overall patterns, that is what we see. But again, it still doesn't have to be that way. We can design school choice plans with our goals in mind and then work backwards to how we're structuring the role of choice as a tool within those policies. So we could set up, I mean, I, I think Omaha, Nebraska has, has a plan, if I'm remembering the right place, I think it is. Um, Omaha, Nebraska has, has a inter-district school choice plan that serves to alleviate stratification, alle alleviate segregation. Um, and other, other places uh, have also tried this and, and found it to be successful, whether by race, by, by income. I mean, there's the famous Wake, Wake County, um, North Carolina plan, which uses uh, family income and wealth as a, as a, as a tool within a, a, uh, a choice plan to, to make sure that schools aren't as stratified. Um, so it's important to, to think of school choice as something that can be inserted in a plan that can accomplish larger goals that we have as a society. And one of those certainly can be the issue that Mary raised, which is segregation or stratification. If I could respond, this dovetails with something that struck me as I was listening <coughs> about the issue of, 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 of the assignment of children to schools. And it struck me that uh, that, that term, student assignment, I find really offensive. The, the, notion, the, the notion that some government board or political board or wh whomever it is is assigning your child to the place that they're supposed to learn. And, and, and when people talk about larger goals, serving the larger goals of society, especially when it's in the context of using your children to pursue those larger goals, I get very, very nervous. Um, is the, is any, are any of these larger goals more important or for that matter better served by the government structuring a plan to serve those societal goals than it is for parents who love their child, know their child, to pursue their individual goals of having their life be the best that, that it can be. I mean, it, it, it aren't our larger goals that pe kids can read, that kids are successful, that kids don't get killed in school, that they don't get hurt in school? These should be our goals. And if they are, these are the same goals as parents have, except for parents have a greater incentive to pursue those goals. Um, and it doesn't get lost in the system. So when we talk about student assignment and serving the larger goals of society through how we assign children to the, the environment that they're suppo supposed to be in for 12 years and, and is the basis of their life outcome, um, uh, that, that makes me really concerned. So, um, you know, there is compulsory attendance in the United States, virtually state by state, right? So students, right. parents are compelled to s send their children to school. That's different and, than the government body assigning. Right, but, the, but essentially the government body is, is a uh, locally, in most instances, a locally elected school board. And so while I know that, that you would think of government as sort of evil, bad, no, I no, think no, of, but hang on, but I would, human beings right, but, what's best for right, I, I would say, I would say that the government is, represents essentially the collective sure. view of a group of people which are not just parents and not just, and I think that's do right. Think that, do you think a collective body should, should raise our children? They're not raising them, they're essentially they're defining how you <laughs> allocate public education to families. Okay. Well, if, I, if I might, let's clarify. 
Uh, well, the book, uh. <laughs> the book and this discussion can definitely raise lots of deep philosophical issues about what is the public and you know what is the public good, and the opening chapters do that. But I would, I would um, I'd like to address another sort of specific piece of what um, Kevin just said. So charter school authorizers are the, I should define them, they're the entities that, that, over, that decide who gets a charter when people apply. They write the contract uh, that monitors them. If a school doesn't perform or does perform, they make the decision whether to renew it or not. And so when we have an overall goal like, uh, I'll use your words, make sure schools are not stratified, the vehicle that a school board would have or the state board of education would have, they get to say yes or no to a charter application. There's no abstaining. There's no going back necessarily right away and redesigning the whole policy structure. So there's a thousand entities out there today who have to make yes or no votes on an individual school. So I'll give you Denver, for example. Two schools illustrate this perfectly. Denver School of Science and Technology is originally created to create a um, a diverse school with more, frankly, whites in it than are in the traditional, than in the rest of the public schools in Denver, because they had a generation or decades of white flight. So they intentionally uh, put it in a place. Uh, they designed a program that would be attractive, like magnet schools, and it succeeded. It has demographics that look like Denver's population, but that means it's more white than the traditional schools that the whites have left in general. Meanwhile, uh, West Denver Prep has almost 100% low-income minority kids. It has incredible results, 90th growth percentile, uh, proficiency rates you wouldn't see elsewhere. That school is intensely more all one race or poverty than the rest of the district, but the families love it. The question before the school board was, should we have more of them? So my, if, if we're gonna make sure schools are not stratified, would you have denied Denver School of Science and Technology? Would you have denied West Denver Prep or close it down? Would you not, and Denver looked at those decisions and they said, we need more elementary schools that serve ELL kids successfully, and we need them in the northwest corner of the city. They did an RFP and they asked West Denver Prep to apply, and, and they now have have four more charters and they're creating more schools with similar results. Those schools are also all minority. Is that a bad thing for the society? And should we weigh the greater societal good of making sure we're not stratified against schools that are demonstrably succeeding and doing great things with kids who, who need better choices? So the choices, the philosophy about what's public and what is democracy is one thing, but for a school board member in Denver, the question is, should I have more of the good ones, and should I have fewer of the bad ones? Okay, over here to Dr. Maron. Yep. Adam has brought us down, down to the very crux of the issue, which is values. And you know, we talk about how important it is for the government to and policymakers to articulate the goals and then to carefully and thoughtfully implement choice plans. But it's really about values and about what whether we see education as a public good or a private good. In Adam's perspective, he's talking very much about the private good. Parents invest, parents take decisions, there's winners or losers. Some kids will get good options, some won't. Um, we believe school choice and can be serve both, uh, but, but even with school choice itself, if it's thoughtfully implemented, it can serve the public's broader goals. Um, and I think an example of that is just what Alex has taken up with a thoughtful charter school initiative or, or thoughtful use of planning that can counteract and serve the, the public good uh, and, uh, and still promote choice options, but still pursue those publicly stated uh, goals that, that are envisioned to serve all, all students and, and look out for students' best interest, all students. So, so the, the, <coughs> the public good versus private good thing is, is I know, a serious issue, but uh, in, in my mind, the, the public good is a byproduct of, of uh, the, the private good, right? I mean, the public good are the ramifications of um, uh, the benefits of children being better educated and having better life outcomes and, and the, the externalities, the positive externalities of those. So that's an argument possibly for subsidizing education, especially for low-income children who can't buy enough quality of an education. And no one here uh, um, really is arguing with that point. People who support vouchers or tax credits, these are all ways of ensuring that even the poorest in society are insured uh, enough funding, enough opportunity to get a good education. In other words, there is no conflict between the public goods that we all agree on, which is a better educated, uh, more fulfilled citizenry. That's the product of good education. And so what the real question is, what system gets us a, the best education? And what, what's the most feasible? In my mind, you look at the evidence, and uh, you, you could do class size reduction and spend billions upon billions more 
to get it down to like five kids per class. Um, you could uh, try intra-district choice or, or charter schools, which sometimes there's some evidence of magnet schools and, and, and charter schools uh, actually performing better. But to me, I look at the evidence and the balance of the evidence, the random assignment studies out of uh, voucher and even tax credit uh, studies demonstrate if you want to, for less money, and we're not talking about, you know, if you had an unlimited budget, what would you, what would you do? If you want long-term impacts on student achievement and life outcomes, you go with private school choice, vouchers and education tax credits. In Florida, in countless voucher programs that they've studied, uh, the, the net effect is positive or a wash at, at worst. And these are tiny, tiny programs that couldn't even be remotely called a, tr a true market. And, and, and so, you know, the, the question for me is what public good or what public purpose is there beyond a better educated populace? And, and if we do go beyond those, what right do, does the government have to, to decide, well, your child shouldn't have a re religious education or shouldn't be allowed to, or they need to only have this kind of pedagogical approach, even if you think it's the best, and, and, and it turns out that it is. There's a, there's a lot, uh, there's a lot there, Adam. <laughs> um, the part, part of it is, is claims about outcomes uh, of different choice plans are, are really problematic. Um, we, we have a, a chapter actually written by Gary in the book, uh, Gary and some of his colleagues, um, that, that walks through all the different uh, studies of different types of choice. Now, interestingly enough, charter schools and vouchers, not, not neo-vouchers, not the tax credit vouchers, but the conventional voucher type, charter school and vouchers have been studied a lot, uh, particularly charter schools, particularly, particularly given how, how relatively new and, and how quickly the, the policy has expanded. Other types of, of school choice have not been studied nearly as well um, in terms of really being able to make strong judgments about uh, how well they're doing. With regard to charters and conventional vouchers, um, I think a wash is probably the, the, the most uh, global statement we can make. Um, there, are, there have been a lot of voucher studies and even reanalyses of initial data of voucher uh, studies um, that have been done by advocates of school vouchers and, that have, and that's why we oftentimes see reanalysis of the same data and reaching different conclusions uh, from the original authors. But even, even those advocate studies tend to show a wash um, with, with occasional blips of success. Um, so, so what we see is... Uh, that, that's just the, not the case, actually. Uh, the, I mean, the, 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 the balance of the studies, the, uh, you, can, you can count them up. Find uh, a small, small but significant. So, so a, a small we, but we significant effect. We don't there's, use there's, there's counting approaches to decide whether or not the research. Well, they're, they're, called, they're called uh, meta studies. Or no, no, meta, meta analyses are very different than counting up yeah. what different I, results. I, are. I understand that, but when you look at the totality, at worst, it's a wash for a lot less money. And when you add in the studies that show a competitive effect from private choice programs on the performance of public schools then what you have is them keeping up with the improvements from competition in the private sector. David Figlew has extremely good studies on the Florida program, which is a tax credit program, both showing that, that the students maintain parity with equivalent students in the public schools and that there, there's a competitive effect from the, the education tax credit program. So, so I, so, getting I, hot and heavy up here. I, wait, One more. I, I actually wanted to finish. So okay. I, I, won't, I won't go back and forth on this, but yeah. clearly we disagree. But I also want to get to this issue of... Well, what do we disagree well, about? Okay. Well, uh, we're <laughs> quite a bit, actually, Adam. So, so what, what I did want to touch on was, was the main point, I think, that you were making, and which is the question of how much do we rely on individual parent choices to drive the overall public good? There was a, um, a New Yorker cartoon this past year that had these two, two mothers walking along a sidewalk, and one mother is talking to the other, and, the, and her daughter is walking a little bit in front uh, with a nice uh, school uniform on. And one mother is talking to the other and says, you know, it wasn't our first choice in schools, but we had a group on for it, for what, so what the hell? <laughs> uh, and, and, I, and I think that it's important to recognize that, I mean, this is sort of a, a fun way of, of, of getting at an important issue, which is that um, sometimes the choices that parents make are, are strongly evidence-based, sometimes they're nonsensical, sometimes they're even harmful. Um, and, and just as importantly, the information and the, the practical choices available to different parents in different groups within our society are very different, depending on other resources those parents have, transportation certainly being key among them, but, but also knowledge and skill and understanding uh, information that's available or not available to the parents. 
um, and, in, and also in the ability to sort of negotiate within different choice systems. Alex Medler and I go way back probably a decade or so. And we've had a lot of interesting conversations about this idea of how do we make school choice most effective for, for, for people across the board in our society? How do we overcome some of these barriers that stop, uh, that, that make big sort of obstacles that, that some parents face and other parents don't face? And how, how to sort of make that a more level playing field? I think that's a really important point. Okay, what's gonna happen? I, I want Mary to respond and then I'm going to go to the audience for questions. So, yeah, I, I just, you know, for me, the argument about kind of who's getting the better test scores is not, it should not be the heart of it, especially when we are, for the most part, talking about margins in any of these systems. So it's, it's a marginal change. And, and I, you know, would argue that the, the import, again, the importance of voice and communities really wrestling with these things is, is critical to what we are as a society, to not stratifying by religion, to not stratifying by race, to not stratifying by income or culture, or, and that, that the, the space, and, and this is you know, spoken as you know, a parent who went through DC public schools with three of my children in a bilingual setting where you know, there were mostly Salvadoran refugees at, at the school and African American you know, at various points in time, um, and there was enormous value to us wrestling with trying to understand each other's um, culture and values. And I, and I think that, um, you know, that we tend to, you know, want to go to our, our comfort zones. And I think that part of what public education does, and I think some of the charter schools work at it intentionally. and. And, uh, and, and I would argue that many of the traditional public schools don't do it well. I mean, it's not that it's, it's, not that it's, it's solved there, but I think that wrestling with this in, in community is an absolutely essential part of, of why we are a civil society at, at best a little bit still, and, and what we need to do in order to retain some of that civility. Okay. Uh, let, we're going to ask you, sir, to uh, ask your question. Wait for Mike. Thank you. Yeah, I have a couple of questions. Uh, okay. No, I don't think it really needed. But uh, are there many schools these days that you enter by taking a test, which, of course, uh, you would get integration that way. Uh, <clears throat> for example, a uh, school I'm familiar with in Cincinnati, uh, Walnut Hills, you have to take a test to get into that school. And that school has been there for, I think, many, many decades. And it seemed to work well. Uh, that's one question. The other is when you've got these stratified schools, uh, all white, all black, are the faculties integrated? In other words, in, a, in an all-white school, do you have many African-American teachers? In an all-black school, if you, do you have many white teachers? I'm just curious. I could, I could take both of those on really okay. quickly. Yeah. Really. Um, the, the second question is, uh, in general, uh, the teaching force tends to be a lot more white and female than the overall student body. Um, the, the, there are schools, particularly, I think, I think it's true that, that uh, some charter schools serving areas that are um, largely Latino or largely African American will make an effort to uh, have a teaching force that's more reflective of that population. But, and I know a Teach for America, for example, another organization uh, has tried recently to try to diversify its teaching force a little more because those are the, those are the schools that those teachers tend to serve. So there are some, there's some recognition of, of that and some attempts to address it. Um, but overall, the, the, popula the teaching population tends to be more white and female. The, the, the first question dealt with test-based admissions to schools. The most, I think the most well-known are the New York test-based schools, New York City test-based schools. Um, there, there have been several attempts to try to tease out what's going on in terms of equity at those schools, in terms of 
um, whether or not that test-based process is fair and equitable to students because we do tend to see, uh, certainly in New York, we see a lot uh, whiter, whiter student population and wealthier student population in those schools than in the state, than in the city as a whole. Um, and the, the measurement precision of those tests that are used uh, tend to have a wide error band. If you think about like presidential polling where they talk about plus or minus five points, that sort of thing. If you think about tests having a similar error band, um, you have students being excluded or included in those schools when there's really no difference in their test scores. So that's part of the, part of the issue. Okay. Back here, can we pass the mic? Thank you. My question is for um, Alex and for Gary. Um, Alex, you talked about the importance of the role of authorizers and argued that you needed at least a chapter in this book, if not more, and, uh, and the importance of the authorizers as being able to close down low-performing charters. Um, however, we see in states like Ohio, uh, in Michigan, in Florida, in Arizona, an extraordinary number or percentage of very low-performing charters that are not being closed down. Um, and I think Gary has, has written about this as well. So I'd like your perspective, your work for the National Association of uh, Charter Authorizers. What are you guys doing uh, to encourage authorizers um, to have uh, the guts and the conviction to close down low-performing charters? And Gary, I'd like your perspective on that as well. Uh, thank you. That's an excellent question. Um, and we're doing quite a bit. We, we share the observation that there are too many charter schools that are operating that um, shouldn't be, and that when they come up for renewal, uh, some schools are renewed that shouldn't have been. So it depends on which state you're in, the, the number and the proportion will change dramatically. Charters vary by state, but wherever you go, there are charter schools that are unlikely to close. One of the th things I do when I travel around working with policymakers or authorizers, I ask in your state, how many charter schools are operating that you wouldn't send your, your kids or your friends' kids to that you wish somebody had closed? And they, everyone can visualize a number. And then I say, well, how many schools recently have been closed that you really think should have stayed open? And the ratio is always there's a lot more that need to close and almost none that are pretty good that were closed for the wrong reason. So we need to ratchet up the policies and the tools so that people can make those decisions. On the, on the ground, we work with authorizers, A, to pick schools better in the first place and have rigorous uh, process up front, but B, we try to have them have performance frameworks that um, measure with a balanced scorecard a bunch of measures, particularly student growth. We try to make those match to the contracts authorizers have. We, we are working with state policymakers to rewrite the state laws to recognize the legitimacy of those contracts and the expectations, and then we work with it to try to give the authorizers the, the, the information they need and then to make sure that they're clear that the process is not about who screams the loudest, but that it's about what's best for kids and they're looking at that data. With all those things in place, we're seeing some model authorizers that are able to um, have the will, they're able to act on it. When they make the decision, it's able to be sustained. So there are things you can do in policy and practice and, um, and collectively with communications to, to make that happen more often. And we're encouraged that it, it can happen and we're working on it a lot in the next few years. Now, when we look at the charter school results, there's, it's important to, to, to recognize there's very big differences between and within states. But when we talk about those between state differences, some states are doing better with their charter school reforms than others. In part, I think it, it, uh, it comes back to the values issue. When we see bipartisan support for a charter school law, we tend to see smaller numbers of charter schools and a more uh, focus on oversight and quality. And then when we see a more partisan approach, we often see uh, the values coming in, which is the uh, belief through competition that uh, the quality of the charter schools isn't as important as the quantity. The more that we get, the more competitive pressure will be applied to the traditional public schools. And now when we look at the overall evidence, we see that the charter schools, the states with the largest charter schools, the largest number of charter schools tend to perform less well. The states with the fastest growing uh, charter school reforms uh, tend to perform less well. Uh, it's the states with the smaller numbers and also the states with more closures that we're seeing that. When, you know, closing to poor performing charter schools is important um, for a number of reasons. One, it sends a signal to the other schools that they really have to be accountable or 
they can have their schools, uh, their charter revoked. But it also lists, lifts the aggregate results for those remaining schools. And the third uh, advantage of closing bad schools is that it shifts the limelight, that, that attention that many of the, the poor performing schools get because there are successful charter schools out there that are often overlooked because so much attention is put on those uh, schools that are scandal uh, ridden and, and struggling. Gary, like, I know Adam wants to get in, but I'd like to add one other point. I don't disagree with what you're saying, but we have some states that have such weak or tight laws that there's nothing happening at all. So it's, you know, you need enough, you need a good law that that allows a charter school application to be viewed on its merits, so that it has a chance of being approved. Some states have it, so that you can't even get there. Once they're there, I'd agree that quality control matters a lot. And I would say, Naxa is a pro charter organization. We want there to be a large, vibrant, successful charter sector. And there are amazing things, innovative things going on in the charter space. And the inability to deal with what's not working, it creates obstacles for those who are hitting it out of the park. And if we can address the problems of, of failing, festering charter schools, those rock stars and the innovations will be much more credible. The policymakers won't put the clamps on them. Um, people will see it, and its impact will be much greater. So we consider the activity to strengthen the closures um, and to strengthen the rigor is a very pro-charter step to support innovation and its replication. Interesting tidbit here, and I'll use I'll use Life Skills Charter in Denver, which Alex is very familiar with, and it was finally closed down I think last year, but the process took what five years, something like that, um, and and one of the things that was going on there raises an issue that I think we also see with cyber charters right now, is that. Life Skills said, hey, look, the reason why we have bad results is because we're essentially a mission-driven school. We are, we're out there reaching out to kids who, are, who, would, who would not be successful in any school. Um, and what we're trying to do is to not so much be a last chance school, but a school that's, that's, that's driven to, um, to serve a particular part of the population. And of course we're going to have low scores. We hear the same thing. Uh, Gary and I have both done work recently with cyber charter schools, studying cyber charters. And we hear the same thing, the complaints, when, when you look at the actual outcomes of these, um, of these large, they, gen they tend to be for-profit companies operating cyber charters. Um, we see very poor uh, measured outcomes. Um, and part of the response, a big part of the response has been, well, that's because kids who opt into these cyber charters are, are kids who were, who were not successful in the brick and mortar schools that they were in. We're serving a population that would otherwise have low scores. Part of the response to that is to try to look at growth, to try to look at, well, let's, let's see where the kids start at and see, and see where they move. Um, but another part of serving a, a, a disadvantaged community, by the way, there's a question as to how disadvantaged the cyber charter population really is, but, but even accepting that claim, what we also see with a lot of these schools is a lot of mobility. Um, so kids moving in and out a lot, and that makes it very hard to measure growth because the kid who was there last year or the kid who was there even this fall isn't necessarily there that spring. Um, and so you have issues of attrition and selection that are very difficult um, when you're talking about figuring out whether these schools really are doing well. And that's part of the reason why I think it's difficult to close some of them because they have a response to, to, the, to the simple, well, your kid's test score outcomes, for example, are not doing well. Can, can I say something really briefly on the alternative education of really extremely at-risk kids is a, is, a, is a bit of a wrinkle and a challenge in the charter space, but I'd say this is another one that gets back to values, too. I think states and communities need to wrestle with what is it we expect and want public schools to do when a young person is 18 to 20 years old or 16 to 20, so they're still entitled to go to the public schools. They're reading at the fifth or sixth grade level. Uh, we don't really, they're not constitutionally guaranteed to get to go to school for more than two years. So what can you do in those two years before they become 21? And um, so first off, we need to figure out which schools, whether they're district or charter or cyber, are serving populations this challenged. And then we need to decide what it is we expect schools to achieve if we're going to evaluate them for it. Denver, you know, with that, that life skill school you're talking about, they use that performance framework. They, the state has developed a definition of what counts as a school that's an alternative education campus. They rate those schools so you can actually see the distribution amongst the 20 different schools that serve kids that, that challenged. And then with that data, they were able to close it and have the state board back them up. So if you wrestle with these values about what you achieve or what you expect, then put in place tools to measure it and educate people that expectations still need to be there, they just need to be different, um, then you can act. 
The, uh, I just wanted to circle back to, to one of the things that keeps coming up, which is um, uh, who decides? Who decides the quality? Who decides what schools operate? Who decides where parents are allowed to go or what's a good school? And, and you know, the, the Groupon comment about uh, a, a parent choosing a school because it was a Groupon, you know, it, it's a joke, but there's a really sick underbelly to that. And that goes to the heart of this discussion. Um, that I think the, really the only argument uh, against private school choice in, in educational freedom is that too many parents are stupid and careless with their children. But ultimately, that's what we're talking about, that they don't have enough information, they're not educated enough, they're not smart enough, and they don't care enough about their children to determine what a better or worse school is. And I find that really offensive, not because I, I, I think everyone's a genius or not because I think every parent is good, but most parents care enough about their child and know enough to determine better or worse. And we see this in voucher programs and charter school programs where parents line up around the block for lotteries to try to get their kid into a school that they know is better than the school they're currently in. It doesn't take a whole lot of brains or a whole lot of education to know better or worse. It doesn't take a whole lot of brains to know your kid can't read, period. And that's the fact of life for a lot of kids at the lower end of the socioeconomic scale today, right now. Now there are parents that are hopeless lost causes. And we're not talking about these people on the very, very far margins. That's a particular problem in and of itself. But for the vast majority of low income families, yeah, they do know enough to know better or worse. And the fact of the matter is, even the cheapest car on the market today will still get you to work. That's not true of education. The worst schools, a lot of them in this country, do not educate children to a degree where they can function at a basic level as citizens in this country. So that's the framework we're talking about. And I, I, I want to really highlight that because sometimes it gets glossed over. Ha ha, parents are stupid. But yeah, some of them are. But if parents choose the one that won't get them there, what the, do you do? The, the question is whether they are more likely to choose it than the current system and whether they're better at discriminating than a government-appointed board or a government-authorized board. Okay. That's the question here. We're winding, we're winding down on time. Um, I, well, I, will, I will let you respond, but I need you to brief. Okay. Do I, I do brief okay. sometimes. Um, <laughs> Adam has a Adam, Adam has a very strong skill at pulling my chain. Uh, so, so the, there there is. I mean, I, I think it's very important to not start to, to to understand that we're starting off by assuming that every parent cares about their kids. Certainly, there are there are some who are dysfunctional, and, and we can set that aside. But it's not it's not a matter of caring. It's a matter of efficaciousness. So, so the solution isn't so much just to sort of hope that every every parent so chooses the right now. No. The, the solution isn't isn't to figure out uh, a way to 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 make every parent make the right decision between a good school and a bad school. The solution is to to have a system that drives all schools toward excellence, rather than a system that that stratifies between using the car exa example Mercedes and Yugos, right? So if we if we have a, we, if we have kids in the Yugo classrooms, we have a problem. Um, and whether that, that came about from, from a catchment or a traditional assignment process or from uh, a school choice process, it's a problem. Um, and, and understanding that choice is just a tool to get us there helps us to shape the choice policies so that we do actually get there. Okay, thank you for uh, Okay. Uh, I, I want to follow up on what Adam was saying, but also ask something related to the campaign this fall. I, I, th I found the car analogy really bad, actually, because if I'm buying a car, I look at the Kelly Blue Book, I read the car pages, I look at consumer reports, there's ways of rating cars on performance and, um, and quality and what people think about them. And it seems to me, um, uh, one of the earlier questions, people were rattling off states, and I was struck by how many of those states are states in play in this fall campaign, like Florida and Ohio and Arizona, and and, and yeah, and, and it just seems like in many of these states that are in play, um, this choice debate is is really going on. Uh, and yet, like I know that there there have been reports that cyber schools are doing terribly in Michigan and Pennsylvania, but they were expanded there. Um, the Florida Education Commissioner just resigned uh, over questions about assessment, I think. I mean, so there's, it seems like people out there in the states are very confused 
about this issue in particular and about how to gauge schools, whether it's right for their children. And, and I, I, I don't want to speechify here, but just, just one other observation. Um, when I was in Pennsylvania a couple weeks ago, I mean, I saw more commercials for K-12 Inc. on TV than I saw for the presidential campaigns in, in a state that's a key state. And if I was a parent watching TV, I'm, that looked like a car commercial to me, not a way to sort of independently assess whether that was the right school for my child. I just wanted to respond to the car analogy and, and to your response that it's a problem if kids are in a, in a Yugo. Well, Yugo is one thing, but the, the cheapest cars on the market today are safer and more reliable than 30 years ago, right? And, and a lot of the difference between cars is luxury items. Does it have leather, right? Um, how fast does it go? Even though I can't go over 65 on the highway, can it go 200? So a lot of these aspects of cars and the differential between them are bells and whistles and things that are not central to their functionality, right? And so right now we're talking about whether we have fun a functional education for poor kids, and we don't. The, the analogy is even, even the poorest families in a market have access generally to functional items. If you subsidize them, through private charitable giving, education tax credits, or vouchers, then they can buy what the middle class can buy. So uh, th 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 this distinction, I don't, I don't think, I don't think is as big as you think. And we're never going to eliminate differences between people. Okay, uh, people have tried to eliminate poverty and equalize all outcomes in societies. It generally ends up with a lot of dead people. And I don't think that should be the framework, but better or worse. Can we make this better? And does the market, do these private sector alternatives actually do a better job at delivering what we all want? Little mild hyperbole, I think it's fair to say. Um, if, if you want all equal outcomes, there's, I think, generally dead bodies let, around let me, that. Let me, uh, let me speak to the one part of the question um, about like what's happening during the campaign season and what's going on here. I think um, hats off to the editors of this book for trying to focus empirically and then explain that there's a lot of differences to this, a lot of nuances, big challenge, hard to do in a book. Um, for a campaign, it's even harder to sort of get down to the sound bites. And it's the sound bites that are pretty likely to simplify and appeal primarily to values. It's hard to get data into campaigns like that. But I, I think it's important to realize, I come from Colorado, where we have as many people in charter schools as we do exercising in district choice. We have, you know, a ton of people are making choices. And when you talk to parents, they don't really think about which type it is and what movement they're part of very often. They pick schools and they move around and they go to them. Um, and uh, the evolution of some of the, like the school board members to say, well, it's, I, I can't really be opposed to all the families exercising choice because a ton are. It's different than it was. Um, a different over time it's it's shifted over time and i'd suggest that the the public is looking for schools that want them to be good and sometimes we have this value rhetorical debate that gets off onto particulars without realizing that most people just want good schools and they're beyond some of this they're looking for quality and and other things they value and they're making choices through a variety of mechanisms and the people who are governing these systems they deal with the details and the politicians, in general, they support choice and they support good schools, um, and, they, and it's, that's bipartisan. We, the pr presidents have supported charter schools since the movement got started. Um, both parties, you know, multiple administrations. It's been a bipartisan thing, um, especially at the national level. Yeah, and, and I, would, I would still say that the debate um, should be alive and well, because I'm not sure that it's sustainable. Um, I'm not sure that the position of the president and the bipartisan thing that you should grow the charter sector is, the, it, is really sustainable. I'm not sure that it doesn't create more stratification, that it doesn't create more confusion for parents. And I, I would really question, as we work with districts where they've been closing and turning around schools and closing and closing, whether it's you know Philadelphia or New York or um, you know Newark or Pittsburgh, Closing schools, you know, parents holler about it. It takes five years to close even what's a so-called bad school because you know, actually it's really a problem for a family <laughs> if their school closes. So I think that, I don't think we're at all kind of on a path that we should sort of say, oh, we, we, we've sort of got the paradigm shift that we, that we need. I, I, I think we're very far from it. And, and um, 
but you know, hopefully the, these kinds of conversations will help us a little bit. Okay. I think we've got a great idea for a day-long panel. I'm going to take one last question, but before I do, this is the uh, at the conclusion of, of, of this uh, wonderful discussion we've had, I do need to point out that there are a number of upcoming events here at the National Press Club, and I'd like to draw attention to a few of those. October 2nd, there will be a National Press Club luncheon with Arnie Duncan, who is the Secretary of Education. Uh, that's here at the Press Club. September 13th, there will be a luncheon with James P. Hoffa, who is the President of the International Brotherhood of Teamsters. September 6th, Kathleen Turner, actress extraordinaire, will be speaking at the Press Club as well. And on September 12th, Tony Perkins, president of the Family Research Council, will be talking uh, about a number of things in, a, in addition to uh, the horrible shooting that happened at uh, his offices there uh, in Chinatown. So uh, very last question goes to the gentleman in the back. Uh, I'm interested in finding out uh, to what extent for-profit schools are a factor in primary and secondary education. Uh, are they an increasing presence? And are there data uh, comparing their performance to uh, a public and other nonprofit schools? Yeah. Right now we're seeing the, the for-profit schools largely are growing and expanding through the charter school sector. Um, about 35% of the nation's charter schools are operated by private entities or education management organizations that about half are for-profit and half are non-profit. When we look at the non-profits, uh, the states where there's larger concentrations of the non-profits, they tend to perform better. The states with high concentrations of for-profit schools tend to perform less well. Um, the research out there on the for-profit schools, a lot you have to depend on what they sell, say themselves and they tend to say that they do really well. The independent research is showing that they're not performing very well. Um, there have, have been a lot of concerns uh, recently about the level of profit making. And that frustrates me sometimes because I always wonder, especially when that these, these concerns are raised by policymakers, because why should we be concerned about that? They are for-profit companies. They are operating, with, they've, we've invited them into the education sector, and they are, they are doing what they are designed to do, which is pursue uh, private interest and pursue profit. And the big dilemma here is, coming back to the issue about thoughtful policy making, how do we put in place the, the proper incentives and the right safeguards so if we are going to have these operators in the public school sector, how can they pursue the public, the public good and the public's best interest? But they are increasingly getting attention and they're controversial because of the level of profit from some of the companies that game the system. Um, and again, it's not so much the problem of the companies because they are doing what they are designed to do. Unfortunately, it's a, an issue for our policymakers that we have to think about better ways to put in place safeguards and incentives and incentives so that they will pursue the public good. All right. I want to thank your panelists, one and all, for being here. It's been a thought-provoking conversation at the least. And thank you to our C-SPAN audience. Have a wonderful day.